Well, let's get started with your questions. You have submitted some excellent questions, and Dr. Sproul uh, has always said that there are no stupid questions. Not true. That's not true? Okay. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you want to clarify? I, I say it, but it's not really true. It's, you say it, but I... <laughs> well, I, I will not... I will not be fulfilled as the moderator of this particular session unless we're able to elicit from Dr. Sproul a response that he gave at the National Conference last in Orlando. How many were here for the National Conference? We, we, Dr. Thomas and I were trying to reflect on the particular question that was asked, but, and I'll try to do my best R.C. Sproul impression, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll get a response like that. We'll see. Well, let's get started. Dr. Sproul, why was it necessary for Christ to be baptized? I really didn't get the, the full opportunity in my address to, uh, to, to explain that in full. But what had happened is, in my judgment, was that uh, as the new Adam and as our representative, our mediator, in order to qualify for being our Redeemer, had to obey every jot and tittle of the law of God. Now the command to be baptized, to repent and baptize, was not part of the Mosaic law or any of the legislation of the Old Testament. It was basically a new requirement that God had imposed through the voice of his prophet, John, on the people of Israel because of the radical nearness of the breakthrough of the kingdom of God. That's the reason that, he, that is given. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. His fan is in his hand and, you know, the, root, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. And the point is, is that uh, here is Israel's redeemer about to arrive on the scene and the people were not ready. And so now God required them to undergo this cleansing rite that before had been restricted to proselytes joining Israel and take a bath because they were unclean. Now, if this is a requirement given to Israel, to the people of God, then it's a requirement given to the one who is representing Israel, namely the Messiah. And so I think that's what Jesus is saying. Look. I have to fulfill all righteousness, that I have to do everything that the law requires. Even though I'm sinless, the law requires this preparatory baptism, and so I'm submitting to it. I think that's basically what it is. Dr. Thomas, what was your third proof point for the resurrection going to be in your earlier lesson before you ran out of time? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I think my first point was that the evidence of the early church's commitment, and commitment even to die, signaled their belief in a factual resurrection, particularly a resurrection that was easily falsifiable. Uh, if it wasn't true. Uh, my second point was uh, Paul, the phenomena of Paul in the New Testament, uh, because there was nothing uh, that was psychologically predisposed uh, in Saul of Tarsus to uh, believe in a resurrection or to believe uh, in Christ's resurrection. But the third one, uh, which I didn't get to, was, was simply the evidence, the, the compelling evidence of the empty tomb. And I, I don't want to get into a sparring match on, on apologetics. No, you wouldn't want to do that. No. But um, sometimes I think in some of our circles, uh, we downplay the evidentiary nature of that evidence for fear perhaps that we are yielding to a certain kind of apologetics. Uh, and, and the fact is that I think that the, the phenomena of the empty tomb 
is something, despite, despite Lessing's ugly ditch of history, I, I do think that there is, uh, there is much to be gained by scrutinizing the data and analyzing that data that, that all the evidence points to an empty tomb and a bodily, physical resurrection of Christ. This is open for anyone who would care to answer. After Christ accomplished his atonement, exactly when and how, according to God's moral justice, did the Father's disposition toward the Son change from unmitigated wrath to redemptive favor? take a stab and let them correct me. Um, as Dr. Sproul mentioned yesterday, I, we need to make distinctions, and so while our catechism teaches us that Christ's humiliation extended into the tomb, his exaltation doesn't begin until the resurrection, yet uh, when we confess with the Apostles' Creed that Christ descended into hell, we are actually confessing this is what he suffered on the cross, and so I would believe that when he cries out, it is finished, that he has accomplished our redemption. And he promises one of the thieves next to him that today you'll be with me in paradise. And so I guess uh, given that, I, w I would presume that with his suffering, agony, and death on the cross, he, he bore the full weight of the wrath of God. And um, while his body was laid in the tomb, yet he was already in, in the good pleasure of the Father. Uh, a couple of things that we don't begin to think that there is no redemptive favor in God while He is expressing His unmitigated wrath. He loved His Son even when He was wrathful toward Him. Um, but it is interesting that he died relatively quickly. He was put in a rich man's tomb, and, and all of those seem to me to indicate that the father, and I don't know how to put this, but, but immediately began to rush in and express that favor. Even in death, his, his death is no his burial is no ordinary burial. It's, it's a burial in a rich man's tomb. And I, I think that there are the signals that the wrath is ended and, and complete. Would you call it a, a foreshadowing of the vindication that comes with the resurrection, that burial? I, I would think so. And we see that Jesus commends his spirit to the Father in his dying breath which indicates that the curse has been lifted uh, by then. But again, this business of the transition from humiliation to exaltation following Isaiah, the transition isn't at the resurrection, it's at the burial. The fact that he, that he was laid with a rich man in his death and, and that his body was not allowed to see corruption, not a bone of his body was broken. Those are all together part of the... Uh, protection of the wounded lamb uh, and the acceptance, I believe, of his sacrifice to the Father. How does Jesus' identity as the Word qualify him to uniquely fulfill God's commission to Adam? Well, it's interesting to me that for the first 300 years of church history, the dominant focal point of intellectual uh, investigation and inquiry was on the significance of this title given to Jesus in the prologue to the Gospel of John as the Logos, or the Word of God incarnate. Historically, classic uh, Christology would say that in his role as the new Adam, he performs it, he, perform, he dies touching his human nature, not his divine nature, 
but it is critical that through the whole process, in terms of his active obedience and his passive obedience, it is the God-man. I didn't get to hear your lecture on Curdeus Homo, but I'm assuming, Greg, that that was part of the insight there, that Jesus was truly human, and to subject himself to the law required that he be truly human, not a deified human or a humanized deity. And yet at the same time, that human nature was in an unbreakable union and relationship with the divine nature that, that gave him, and, and you know, Thomas Aquinas speculated on this centuries ago when he asked the question, did the human nature of Jesus enjoy the beatific vision during his entire incarnation? Now that's not a question that Protestant reformers talk about very often, although people like Tarleton <laughs> have. And I think there is a sense in which the, the human nature, though it's not deified, is in such union with the divine nature, with the Logos, that there is the enjoyment of the beatific vision. The pure in heart are the ones who see God. And there never was a time that Jesus wasn't pure in heart. And so I'm assuming that he has this intimate relationship between the human nature and the divine nature that doesn't make it easy, but certainly facilitates his uh, work to accomplish the work of perfect obedience. This question may be related to that. Do you believe Jesus Christ carries Mary's genes or his genes are unique? He is ex Maria. So half of his chromosomes are from Mary. Uh, 23 of them came from Mary. Uh, 23 of them came from the Holy Spirit, but there are no Joseph genes. You know, it wouldn't be surprising if somebody saw Jesus when he was four, playing in uh, Nazareth, and, and I assumed he played with his brothers in Nazareth, that uh, they might have said, um, oh, he looks just like his mother. But they would never have said, he looks like Joseph. Now, they might have said it out of politeness and, and be theologically incorrect, but, but there, is every, there is every likelihood that Jesus would have looked like Mary. Dr. Beale, we'd like to get you involved. Am I on here? Yeah, there we go. Okay. The Bible says that Adam was made in the image of God, but it also says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Is Christ the image of God in the same way as we are? If not, why does the Bible use the same terminology, and what marks the difference between our image-bearing and Christ's image-bearing? Well, Colossians uh, 1, 15 following says that Christ is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. And so even before creation, he was in the image of God. And therefore, that has to differentiate the way he was in the image of God from uh, the way humans are in the image of God. It's, it's a reference ultimately to his, uh, I, his deity and divine sonship in a way that no other human could have uh, been in that image. Having said that, uh, the, the, the image that Adam was in certainly had some uh, uh, correspondence to the divine image and hence to Jesus uh, uh, being in the image of God, and, but, but not exactly as he was in the image of God. And so um, uh, there's a correspondence, um, but, but not in the, in the same way. So. Um, Yes, when, when he is, is born, he certainly is now, uh, as a human, um, in, in, in the human image of God, but even there, as the son of God, he's not just a son of Adam, he is uh, the divine son. And so, 
Yeah, I would say that there is a difference, but there, there, there is some uh, similarity between the human image in that humans image God, and hence have to have some overlap with the image of Christ. I'm, I, I will stand corrected by any others, but... Dr. Nichols, as a church historian, beside the Reformation, what phase of church history should we be most interested in? That's a, that's a hard one. I, I enjoy both early 20th century, which I think is a fascinating time. This is the era of Machen. But I think I would uh, tip my hand a little bit earlier back uh, to the 1740s and the Great Awakening and Edwards and Whitfield. Uh, this was a time in which um, I don't know what our images are of the church, especially in America, but we could also think of this as the transatlantic church. What our images are of the American church, we tend to think of it as sort of pristine uh, through the 1600s and 1700s. The reality is many of those Puritan sensibilities had gone by the wayside as early as the 17 zeros, that first decade of the 1700s. And here we find Edwards, a Puritan minister, solidly committed to these Puritan sensibilities, largely ministering to a congregation that had long ago left their Puritanism behind. And that story was replicated again and again and again across these New England congregational churches through the middle colonies. And um, now that I'm down here, I need to say the southern colonies with their Anglicanism. But uh, long comes the Great Awakening and Edwards and Whitfield and this remarkable moving of the Spirit of God in which there is this preaching of the grandeur of God and the beauty of God and the beauty of Christ and the sweetness of Christ and the beauty of the gospel and this amazing work of the revivals that swept across New England and across the middle colonies and across the seas in Old England. So, I would say the 40s, as in the 1740s. Do you believe we need a another reformation or another revival in this country? I think we could use both in every generation of the church. We need to remember that we need to drink fresh from the wells for our own selves and for our own generation and for the next generation. We, as church historians, Ligonier Ministries, has talked about these folks, the Calvins, the Luthers, the Edwards, and it's certainly helpful for us not to be bound by our limited horizon of our 21st century experience and gain helpful insight from expanding our horizons and looking to the past, but we should not just do that with nostalgia. It's the same God. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Athanasius and Anselm and Calvin and Luther and Edwards that is our God, and we need to remind ourselves of that in every age of the church, every generation. And I think true revival brings reformation. If you look at, um, I'm also into church history, uh, 6th century B.C., um, but if you look at the great kings of Israel, when God brought revival, they reformed the church, they reformed worship. I think of Martin Lloyd-Jones, who, uh, another famous Welshman who prayed daily for revival and was disappointed apparently that it didn't come. But meanwhile, he was reforming the church. And you look at what God has done through his ministry, the, the various missionaries, institutions, banner of truth. Um, he brought, God brought revival through him he reformed the church through him, and, and his work is still being published and going out. And so um, sometimes revival isn't, uh, even as I think was mentioned in one of the talks yesterday, it, it isn't, um, how did you describe it, the lust for casting yourself down from the temple. It isn't things that feast, the eyes feast on, but it's the quiet, steady work of um, the simple means of grace. And so I think that we have seen, even this conference is, is fruit of a reformation of the church and in our theology. Uh, it hasn't come with lots of bright lights and fireworks, 
but it's come through faithful, steady labors in the Word of God. Um, just, a, just a quick story. Uh, we do tend, and particularly in Wales, um, there's been a tendency to almost romanticize the idea of revival to the point that folk become almost inert waiting for the revival instead of getting on with what we're supposed to be doing. We're, we're sort of waiting for the revival to occur. Uh, and, and one of the blessings of all the studies of, of Edwards, and I'm not an Edwards scholar by any means, uh, but grateful to folk like Dr. Nichols and Sean Lucas and George Marsden and Ian Murray and others who've written uh, biographies of, uh, of Edwards. There's, I remember in the Yale series, and I did, I did fork out way too much money buying, buying the entire Yale reprint of the works of Jonathan Edwards. And I remember uh, just glancing at a sermon that, that somebody had alerted me to. I think it was Acts 19, where, where Jonathan Edwards is chastising his congregation because some of them are sleeping horizontally on the pews while he is preaching. I mean, not just, not just nodding off, you know, the, the heavy eye syndrome uh, that preachers see, but, but stretched out on the pew. And I thought to myself, wow, I mean, if, if Jonathan Edwards had to put up with this, I mean, we're, we're in a revival. <laughs> What are some key principles or scriptures that you gentlemen use to re revitalize your faith when you're severely discouraged or feel very dry in your faith? I can tell you that... Key oh, go ahead. No, you haven't spoken. Well, I, I, I can tell you that uh, one of my habits, by God's grace, over the last 10 years or so has been every morning to read 10 psalms and one proverb. So I go through the psalms twice a month, through the proverbs once a month, and honestly, when I started this 10 years ago, this is really the first time that I've had regular Bible reading in my life every day. And makes me wish I'd been doing it forever. And I have, I know there's a whole lot more to the Bible, but I don't think you could get me out of the Psalms without fingernails dragging the whole way out. There's just so much fullness and richness and life. Uh, this, this glorious uh, uh, mixing together of pathos and doxology and deliverance and, and joy and forgiveness and repentance and it's just it's good for what ails me all the time. Do you have a favorite psalm? <laughs> yeah. Probably many people's. I, 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 psalm 51 is uh, it's where you see David sort of diving into the depths of his sin and you watch the blackness of the water he's sinking into, and yet you know throughout the whole psalm that he can't dive below the grace of God, that as deep as he goes, Jesus is down there waiting for him, and uh, that's what I need. Let me ask you all, is your, what is your favorite book of the Bible, or if it is a psalm, maybe which, which psalm? Dr. Sproul, I'll begin with you. You know, it's funny, I, I didn't know he was doing that because I read the Psalms every day myself, and, and I can echo his sentiments on that because the character of God comes bursting through the Psalms. There, and, and historically, when the Psalms have been at the center of the worship of the church, there has been revival. There has been reformation. And... Uh, but that wasn't what you asked me. What, I forget what you What is your favorite book of the Bible? Or if, if it is the Psalms, which psalm? Well, if it's if Psalm 91 is my favorite psalm, but, uh, but I love Psalm 51, and, uh, you know, I love them all. But anyway, uh, 
I don't really have a favorite book, but if I were pushed to the wall, it would probably be, would be Romans. Dr. Thomas? Uh, this is a difficult question. Uh, part one of the question as, as to what keeps a rhythm of intentional um, devotion on a daily basis. And I'm going to sound sycophantic, but I'm going to say table talk. Uh, I just find table talk just, just so, so very well done um, in, in every way. But that sounds self-serving and sycophantic. But, but, but thank you for table talk. Um, and, and table talk on your iPad is really cool because you can take it with you. Um, but uh, the book of Job, and I don't know what it is. I, I'm Welsh. I'm, I'm Celtic. The cup is half empty. Um, <laughs> I'm oppressed. Uh, the English are out to get us. Um, so I, I've, I gravitated to the book of Job uh, almost from the time that I was converted and just got fascinated by it. Uh, if I ever feel in a, in a self-pitying mode, you know, the first chapter of Job is going to knock you dead. Uh, and then if you're still self-pitying after that, the rest of the book <laughs> is going to destroy you. And uh, <laughs> so I, I, I just gravitated towards that doer genre called Job. Dr. Glad Beale? that it's there. Well, I'll do a part one and two as well. Um, what keeps me going in my daily devotions is... Uh, Acts chapter 7, that's not my favorite book, by the way, but in Acts 7, it says that Scripture are the living words, the living oracles of God. Well, if that's true, and we come to any part of Scripture, we can expect and should believe that we're going to be transformed by the living oracle. It's not a dead word. These are living oracles. And one of the things that has really helped my prayer life, because it's so filled with Scripture, is uh, The Valley of Vision by Banner of Truth. If you do not own a copy of The Valley of Vision, let me know, and I'll give you a nickel towards the purchase of it. <laughs> and if you need more, let me know. But really, I pray through those. Uh, I pray through one of those every day. They're marvelous. They're the prayers of the Puritans, and, 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 and also to turn Scripture into prayer in your devotions. Personalize it. One thing I've done, it's funny, you, you mentioned Psalm 51. I, I've memorized most of Psalm 51. When I began to, I began to realize, you know, I, not just when I'm reading should I turn into prayer, but it'd be nice when I'm traveling or wh whatever, and I don't have a Bible before me to have it in my mind and, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to memorize, quite frankly, but you, but you can do it, even if you're not a good memorizer. And, and so, to, to, to pray through those words and, and to turn them into prayer, a lot of times it doesn't take much to turn Psalm 51 into prayer, because it is a prayer. My favorite book is not the Psalms, but that second favorite book is the Gospel of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Dr. Nichols. Uh, my favorite text would be 2 Corinthians chapter 2 through the end of chapter 5. It just seems to be, if, if for some reason that was the only part of the Scripture you would have, I think you could spend an entire lifetime just turning that over and understanding the various dimensions there of what Paul is getting at in terms of ministry, in terms of the eternal weight of glory, and in terms of our charge uh, for our ministry uh, as ambassadors uh, for our ministry of reconciliation. I've always just seemed drawn to that uh, wonderful few chapters right there in 2 Corinthians. Dr. Morales. I don't have a specific favorite book, I don't think, but I certainly echo. I love the Psalms, um, and I, whenever my spiritual life is uh, at a low, um, God always uses the Psalms. 
Uh, for the past 10 years, probably, I've, I've had the delight of studying the Pentateuch in, in, intently, and my love for it grows. Um, but my favorite verse for some time now has been Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but freely offered him up for us all, how will he not also, uh, along with him, give us all things? And I just find it such a logical argument um, that brings me comfort uh, in all circumstances. What did Paul mean in 1 Corinthians one twenty four when he calls Christ the wisdom of God? The first thing one could uh, say is that all of the attributes that are listed there, which are righteousness and uh, redemption, wisdom, sanctification. All of these things are what Christ is, and He represents us in that. You might say, well, how can it be our redemption in the sense that uh, He wasn't redeemed? I mean, all these things have to be true of Him if they're true of us. How was He redeemed? Well, of course He was redeemed, not from sin, but He was delivered from death. And uh, so, um, wisdom then I think the first, one of the first things that comes to my mind is that the Old Testament law was considered to be wisdom, and um, uh, the ultimate wise man should have been Adam. And so I think Christ, uh, part, part of it, I, I, I think, echoed is that, that He's the ultimate man, He's the ultimate wise man, Adam, and He is the one, as Colossians 2, 3 says, it's a parallel to this passage, and him are hidden all the treasures of uh, wisdom and knowledge. And in that context, Adam is not far away. So I think uh, both those, he, he is the one who sums up the law, the wisdom of the law in himself. The whole law pointed to him. He is now, we don't, uh, the Old Testament is now not the major mark. The law is not the mark of uh, uh, the believer. Uh, it was a zenith of God's revelation in the Old Testament. Now Jesus is the zenith of revelation, and so He is that wisdom, the fulfillment of the law. The Bible teaches that Jesus was raised from the dead after three days. If He was crucified on Friday and risen on Sunday, how is this explained? Friday's day one, Saturday's day two, Sunday's day three. <laughs> it's, as, it's as easy as one, two, three. <laughs> but also, it's a Hebrew idiom there that uh, is the way in which they accounted things. Any other comments on that? Okay. All right. Regarding unconditional election, my son asked me, what's the point of creating people if they won't have an opportunity to be saved? What do I tell my son? Come to Reformation Bible College. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always like when people ask Bible questions that are asked in the Bible. And uh, when I get a question like that, I, my, my first response is, I'm so glad you asked, because Paul asked that same question in Romans chapter 9. And so many of our difficult questions are answered in that profoundly difficult chapter. But one of the reasons it's such a profoundly difficult chapter is because it says things we don't particularly like to hear. Uh, essentially, Paul asks that question and reminds us, he actually, he answers it with a rhetorical question. He says, what if God, wanting to show forth his wrath, just hypothetical. Maybe it's this, Paul says. What if God wanted to do this? When the reality is that God does want to do this. God delights to manifest His glory in the expression of His justice against sinners. And the text goes on and says, and to show forth the riches of His mercy. So what Paul avoids is this sort of halfway 
more palatable answer where the function of hell and the soul of hell is to be like a jeweler's vel black velvet on which the jewel of redemption and grace is laid on it that we might see all the beauty of its facets. That would be a sufficient answer if that were what Paul said, but it's not what he says. But rather, both redemption and damnation are manifestations of that one diamond, which is God's glory. If we look at the universe, I would encourage this young person, we look at the universe as existing for the purpose of our well-being, that question makes a lot of sense and it gets a lot harder to answer. But if you understand that God does not exist ultimately for us, but rather we, the creature, exist for his purposes, which is again a heavy theme in Romans 9, if we exist for his purposes, uh, then all of a sudden the potter has liberty to do with the clay what he wishes. Well, from the U in tulip to the L, limited atonement. Is limited atonement just theological semantics? How important is it for the believer to embrace this doctrine? Q, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> what? <are> you <laughs> what? I said, Q, what's the matter with you people? <laughs> Did you hear the question? I didn't, I, you know, yeah. I didn't, I don't think I said what's the matter with you people. I, I think that's a myth. <laughs> I, I think that what I said is what's wrong with you people. What's wrong with <laughs> I stand corrected. I stand corrected. <laughs> and I remember specifically what the question was. What was the, what was the Why question? Why was God so severe in his judgment of Adam and Eve? Would you all like to know the answer to that, that was, question? <laughs> that was just more than I could handle. <laughs> now, what are we talking about here? Limited atonement. Is, is limited atonement is it just, just theological semantics? Yes, it's just th it's theological semantics, so we don't need to pay any attention to it. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? The problem is that... <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's what that's about. It has to do with our understanding of God who God is, and how he functions. The cross was not an accident. The cross was not plan B. The question with respect to limited atonement was what was God's design or plan in sending Christ into this fallen world? Did he plan to make redemption possible and would leave him in heaven, crossing his fingers, hoping that somebody would avail themselves of the power and virtue of the atonement and be saved, knowing that it was theoretically possible that the whole thing was an exercise in foolishness and futility. Or was God's plan from eternity definitely designed to save people and present them to his son. If you say that the atonement was limited in design, or unlimited in design, that God had designed from all eternity to provide an atonement for all people, the only possible conclusion you can come to is universalism given the sovereignty of God. Since the Bible does not teach that everybody is saved, and does teach that only some are saved, namely the elect, then manifestly the purpose and design for the atonement was to save those whom God had determined from eternity to save. It's really not a difficult concept, is it? But it goes against the grain of our evangelical heritage. That, that, that you hear every day, Jesus died for the sins of everybody. Well, if he made an atonement for every human being, then every human being is saved, wouldn't they be? Or else the atonement didn't affect what it was intended to affect. But we know better than that. And it's, again, you have, to, you have to deal with this question from the perspective of the character of God.
and what his plan was. I like this. I was going to say, one of the things that I think is helpful to remember, too, Tulip is more of a 20th century summation, and if you want to see some of the original source here, it's very accessible in the canons of Dort, the heads of doctrine coming from the canons of Dort. And there's some fascinating, I find very encouraging language in Dort, if we were to just go back and read it. And in fact, in the head of doctrine that addresses the issue of the atonement, uh, Dort speaks of how the gospel should be preached promiscuously to all peoples. That is a statement in the canons of Dort from which we get this notion of limited atonement. So, I'm afraid sometimes Tulip has generated a little bit more heat than light, and uh, Dort uh, can help us here, I think, a little more in terms of the whole counsel of God about some of these issues that we tend to fight over in the 20th and 21st century. Yeah, but the Tulip's still better than the daisy. He loves me, loves me not. He loves me, loves me. I thought you were going to say the thistle. <laughs> Dr. Sproul, you quoted Martin Luther, uh, justification by faith alone is the foundation upon, upon which the church stands or falls. The question is, what is that, uh, what are we to believe about N.T. Wright's doctrine of imputation? What does the new perspectives on Paul do to solo fide. Destroys it and the gospel with it. Why don't you tell us what you really think? Well, <laughs> I'm trying to act with some restraint. <laughs> well, the second, the second part of that question was, is his view heretical? What? Is his view heretical? If it isn't, then there's no such thing as heresy. Such thing as heresy. Any of our other seminary professors care to take that on? <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to sit here all by myself and say that. <laughs> I do have a follow-up question. Well, 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 yeah, go ahead. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Thomas. Yes, I mean, uh, heresy is an emotive word, but, but, but if, if, at least in one aspect of new perspective, uh, the answer to the question, how is a person saved, is answered in an ecclesiastical dimension that you join the covenant community. That's heresy. That's medieval Catholicism. That's what the Reformation was, was brought about to negate. So, I, I have no hesitation in saying that that view is heretical. Now, the new perspective is a, is a moving target, uh, so I, I need to be careful about making particular individuals heretics, uh, because it's often very unclear, I mean, even in N.T. Wright, it's often very unclear as to exactly what it is that he's saying, even when he says it again and again and again. As a follow-up to that, it Many in the reform camp believe that N.T. Wright is correct and has a, a good view on the resurrection. Would you agree with that? Yes. Um, so does Rome. So does Rome. Right. Uh, his, uh, his book on um, hope, I've forgotten the title, but um, N.T. Wright's book on I've forgotten the title, but hope is in the title, is, is, uh, is a very good uh, defense of, uh, of uh, supernatural, supernaturalism, especially in the face of, of postmodernity. I mean, I think he, he has a very trenchant uh, defense of historicity uh, and being able to know the facts of history uh, in opposition to postmodernity. I think, I think he's as my students might say, he's right on. Though probably that's more 60s than, sorry, Steve. Well, and his, uh, his larger book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, is a, is a very good book, a uh, very long book. I, I, I read through it brushing my teeth. It took a few months, but um, <laughs> at, at any rate. Um, but 
but it is worth delving into as an expansion of, uh, of this. So he has, and he's got some good things to say on the historicity of the Gospels as well. So he's, uh, he's an interesting character in that regard. Time for one more question. Dr. Sproul, I've heard you mention before a connection with Francis Schaeffer in the early days of Ligonier. Can you share with us your relationship with him and how his influence, uh, how his influence helped you decide the structure of Ligonier Ministries? Hmm. Well, I first became aware of uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer when I was teaching philosophical theology at uh, Conwell in uh, Philadelphia. And I was trying to deal with the uh, uh, famous apologists of the past and so on in my classes, but everybody wanted, kept bringing up Francis Schaeffer, Francis Schaeffer, and I didn't know who he was. And at that time, his uh, popularity was uh, directed, first of all, through reel-to-reel -reel tapes recordings, and then his little books on God is you know, there and all that. Uh, and, but I didn't know him personally until later I met him in Chattanooga at a conference and we chatted for quite some time. And when we were in the process of st starting the Ligonier Valley Study Center in Pennsylvania, uh, I don't know how the meeting came to place, but we did have a lengthy discussion and we talked about uh, the logistics of how you deal with housing and feeding students, which we did. And though our, our ministry was a little bit different from Labrie, Labrie was basically an evangelistic and apologetic outreach, whereas the Ligonier campus was mainly devoted to uh, educating people who already were Christians. But from time to time, uh, he would visit us there and bring words of encouragement and that, that was basically the extent of his involvement. But he gave us a lot of answers to practical questions of you know, have housing and feeding students and that sort of thing. Would you join me in thanking our panelists today for the wisdom they've imparted to us? <laughs> <laughs>